There are a lot of videos out there that talk about the best tips and tricks that every Horizon Forbidden West player should know. But what about the not best tips? Yeah, that's right. I'm talking about the tips that no one else talks about. Maybe because they're not as well known or they're too small to mention, but there's still things that can have a significant impact on how you play and experience the game. Hey everyone, I'm Chaz, and today we are gonna be talking about the best, wait, no. Not the best. Some lesser known, but still amazing Horizon Forbidden West tips and tricks. And I've got a little bit of everything in here. Some interesting ways to take out machines, some hidden or at least lesser known travel mechanics, some ways to increase your health, and a lot more. So let's get into it. And maybe it's because I'm hungry and I haven't eaten lunch yet, but let's start by talking about food. Pretty early on in the game, you'll gain access to cooks and settlements that can make you food in return for shards and animal parts. And most players quickly wrote this off because there is a lot of room for improvement in the way that this was implemented, but it still can be a lot more useful than players realize. Food can basically be a hack or a shortcut to boost skills going into a fight or to get past a certain part in the game that you might be struggling with. It can also give you access to new skills and abilities to help trying out different builds and playstyles without fully committing to it. But let's talk quickly about how food works in general. Eating food will immediately give you back a portion of your health and stamina, as well as give you passive boost skills depending on the food you eat. And the duration of the effect depends on your food duration skill level. At its base level, the duration of food will last for three minutes but you can upgrade it to level one or level two through skills in the Trapper skill tree, which will increase the duration to either four and a half or seven and a half minutes. And through certain armor skills like the plus two food duration skill on the Tanakh Sky Climber, you can upgrade it to its max level of four, which gives you a full 15 minutes. But I would say in general, the seven and a half minutes that you get through the level two skill is plenty, and I probably wouldn't go out of my way to upgrade it any more than that. And like different weapons and armors, foods have different rarity types, with the more rare foods giving you back a larger portion of your health and stamina. And there's a couple of food options that I think are good all around food options to have with you no matter what. In particular, I really like foods like the Great MRE or the Land God's Gift that help you recover weapon stamina more quickly or foods like the Bitter Brew Boar and the Lowland Trail Mix, which help you recover concentration faster. And local stew, which you can purchase pretty cheaply from cooks in any settlement, is a good all-around food option to have because it increases your max health by 20%. This one also pairs really nicely with foods like Shearside Mutton, which increases the amount of health you can get from berries. And there's a few other specialized food choices that are good if you want to experiment with different playstyles or test out other builds. Like if the idea of a low health playthrough gives you a little bit of anxiety, but you still want to test it out, you can use foods like the Grazer's Bounty or Salt Bite Special, which increase your defenses when your health is below 25%, or the Sunfall Amazement or the Fruit on Fire, which increases your range damage when your health is low. And if the Trapper playstyle is appealing to you, but you don't have all the skill points you need to pull it off, you can use foods like the Forge Black and Sirloin or the Fire Claw Stew, which will increase your trap limit, or the Lake and Land that makes you nearly invisible to enemies. And food can also be really useful when completing certain hunting ground challenges because they're usually designed to test you in skills that you may not use all that often. I recently worked with Artix and Honest Cake to do a breakdown of the Shearside Mountain hunting grounds where we used only blue gear, and Honest Cake demonstrated how you can easily complete the frost trial using spicy beanweed morsels, which gives a boost to your stealth range damage. I'll be sure to link that video in the description below if you want to check it out. And another quick tip when using food is that once the food is equipped in your hunter's kit, it can be nearly impossible to tell what that food actually does based on the name itself. But if you press and hold down on the d-pad like you're going to craft more of that item, it'll give you a summary of what the food is and what the skills are that come along with it. But what are some of your favorite foods in the game? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. I am thinking of making a dedicated video where I talk all about some of the best foods to use and how they can work together. So if that's something you wanna see, be sure to let me know that in the comments too. But moving away from food because it really is making me hungry, let's talk about some interesting ways to take out machines. Now for this next part, there may be minor spoilers. So if you haven't yet finished the Forbidden West storyline and don't wanna know anything about it, feel free to skip to the next section. But as part of one of the last main missions in the Forbidden West, you gain access to an EMP bomb that you have to pick up on top of an old Horus using your flying mount. But a lot of players don't realize that once that mission is over, you still have access to EMP bombs on top of every Horus that's on the map. Now the bombs you can pick up after the main mission is over aren't nearly as powerful as the ones you get in mission, but they still can be fun to play around with if you're looking to switch things up. These bombs won't deal any damage to machines directly, but they will instantly inflict shock to any of the machines within the blast radius, which actually has a pretty decent range. So it's a good way to get the drop on a group of machines. And because it instantly inflicts shock, it's also a good way to get an early advantage against machines like Thunderjaws that are strong against shock. 
And there's a couple of other interesting ways that these bombs can be useful. Like for example, if you're out of valor and you need an easy way to farm it, there's an old Horus at this machine site down here that has a group of clamor jaws and bristlebacks. You can mount your Sunwing or your Waterwing, pick up the EMP at the top of the old Horus, drop it on this group of machines, and once it explodes, it should do a decent job filling up your valor bomb. You can fill up your Valor Bar even faster by making sure that you have the Valor Surge Master skill upgraded to level 4, and if you don't, yeah, there's a food for that. Either the Sun King's Delight or CO's Vanquist will give you plus 2 Valor Surge Master. Now an easier option of course would just be for the Gorilla Team to give us access to Valor Potions, which would instantly fill up our Valor Bar, but I digress, something to look forward to in Horizon 3. And let's talk about canisters for a minute because I feel like these are other items in the Forbidden West that aren't really used all that much, and there's a couple of really cool things that you can do with them. Canisters come with certain types of rowcasters and can be either explosive or elemental. You attach them to machines, and similar to other types of canisters, you can use the same type of ammo to hit them, which will trigger the canister to explode. Now, hitting the canister in the first place once it's attached to the machine can be a little difficult and annoying if you're using your hunter bow. But I found that using a Bolt Blaster or a Blast Sling actually works pretty well, so that's definitely what I'd recommend if you're looking to trigger a canister. But some other interesting ways to use canisters are to use them as traps. You can shoot the canister on the ground, and it basically works just like a trap that you can set and trigger at a distance. Not only does this help make it a lot easier to hit, but it also gives you different access to types of elemental traps that the game doesn't have, like Plasma and Frost. Some other fun ways that you can use canisters are to attach them to your mount. Attaching them to your mount and then sending your mount charging wildly into battle will basically turn your mount into a massive bomb. Now this is definitely less predictable and you're more likely to destroy your mount or just have the canisters fall off than you are to have them actually destroy the enemy machine. But hey, if you're looking to try something different, this is definitely worth giving a shot. And if you've got any other cool tips and tricks for using a canister or different ways to use them, be sure to let me know in the comments below. Now, one thing you'll be doing a lot in the Forbidden West is just traversing around the world and getting from one place to another. And there's a couple of things that I found that make this a little bit easier or at the very least, just a little bit more enjoyable. Now, of course, the easiest way to get from point A to point B or campfire to campfire is to fast travel. And if you're not at a campfire, you can use a fast travel pack to fast travel to a campfire. But you don't actually need fast travel packs at all once you get into a certain point in the game. Again, this is just a minor spoiler, but let's just say at a certain point in the game, you unlock a safe space and outside of that area is a campfire that you can fast travel to that doesn't cost a fast travel pack. Once you're there, you can then use that campfire to fast travel for free to any of the other campfires. And there's a couple of other traversal mechanics that aren't necessarily game changing, but are pretty fun to use. Most of these aren't exactly hidden as the game does tell you about them either in the notebook or at different parts within the game through hints and tips, but a lot of players still don't know about them, so I figured they'd be worth mentioning here. First up is the swan dive. I think this is one of the coolest mechanics in the game. Instead of jumping into the water just like any old Osirum Delver, Aloy can swan dive by pressing circle after jump over a body of water. This definitely looks pretty cool and is really satisfying to pull off, especially when you're jumping off a high cliff. And allegedly you can also swan dive really high off a flying mount. I've seen it done in videos before, but I've tried this probably about a hundred times and I've never been able to get it to work. So if you've been able to do it and you know how, definitely let me know what I'm missing in the comments. Another cool traversal mechanic is the grapple jump. Again, this one isn't hidden because it does tell you about this in the notebook and there's a hunting ground challenge which prompts you to do this as well, but basically by pressing circle after swinging to a grapple point, you can launch Aloy in the air. Not only does this look really cool, but it's also a really good way to take out machines with style. And another lesser known mechanic when you're on your flying mount is by pressing triangle, you can do a barrel roll. Now is this something that's going to change the way you play the game? Probably not, but is it something that's going to impress your Quen friends when you go flying past their camp? Most definitely. And my personal favorite traversal mechanic is something that I call the super jump and glide. By pressing jump and the button you use for your glider at the same time, you can basically do a super jump that will launch you into the air and put out your glider at the same time. I'm not sure if this one is a bug or a feature, and hopefully this works on PC the same as it does for PS5, but this is something I use all the time. Anytime I'm jumping off a cliff and just want a little bit more height or distance, or I'm running on the ground and just need a little bit of a boost, or I'm stuck behind a wall and just need a little bit of height to get over it, this one is my go-to. Now the more time you spend traversing the Forbidden West, you'll notice that there are hidden machine sites littered throughout the map. Areas where you'll run into machines that aren't marked on the map, and these can lead to some pretty cool surprise encounters. 
There are a lot of these on the map, and I certainly don't know all of them. So if you know of some cool ones, be sure to let me know in the comments. But here's some of my personal favorites. One of my absolute favorite hidden machine spots is this area just north of Saltbite. You can see here on the map that it's already a pretty busy area with glint hawks and wide moss sites nearby, but right in the middle of them is this campfire. Fast travel to it and you'll be greeted by one of the most badass Thunderjaw sites on the entire map. Now most of the time this site will spawn an apex Thunderjaw which just adds to its awesomeness of him barreling down this mountain and knocking over all the trees in its path. This one is definitely an area to be sure to check out. Next is this hidden Dreadwing site that you can find just north of the Zenith base. Now there's a campfire right here that you can fast travel to but that basically puts you right under the Dreadwing so I wouldn't recommend that one. Instead, travel to the campfire just east of it and you can glide down and you'll find the Dreadwing hiding upside down under the arm of this old Horus, which is just completely awesome. Using a couple of our tips from earlier, if you really want to piss him off, you can fly up to the top of the Horus, pick up this EMP, and drop it on him. And then do a nice little barrel roll under this Horus arm while he's shocked for some extra style points. And the last one that I'll mention, this is probably my favorite spot in the entire game. It's this area just directly south of Jagged Deep Delve. Now technically this one isn't unmarked because there is a Tide Ripper marking here, but I feel like that doesn't entirely do it justice. Travel here and you'll be greeted by not one, not two, but three Tide Rippers, and I've even seen as many as four at the same time here. So this is definitely one of the cooler machine sites that you'll want to be sure to check out. And those are my top lesser known tips and tricks. But what are your favorites? What tips don't you think get enough love and attention? Be sure to let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for even more Horizon Forbidden West content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.